I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Wanna bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Big Money Siege, uh, a couple of hours before we started recording today. A statement from Chicago, the Blackhawks organization, on Jonathan Tays saying that tonight, this Thursday, will be his final game as a Blackhawk. I'll just read the statement real quick here from uh, GM Kyle Davidson. I've had a number of conversations with Jonathan throughout the season about his future with the Blackhawks, and recently we had the difficult conversation that we won't be re-signing him this offseason. Tonight will be his final game as a Blackhawk, and it was very important to us to be able to provide the proper send-off for Jonathan and our fans. He has done so much for this organization, and no matter where he plays next, we're excited for our we're excited our fans get the chance to show Jonathan exactly how much he means to them. By the way, just just add the record scratch here. And no matter where he plays next. Very, very interesting choice of words, CJ. What do you think of uh, this statement? What do you think of Jonathan Taze's future? Let's get right into it. Well, I think it's really cool that organizations announce this before the last game uh, against the Philadelphia Flyers on Thursday. It, it really is a pretty sets up a dramatic moment. It sets up a final goodbye. I mean, had they not come out and announced this, we all would have probably suspected this could be the end, but there would still be that question in terms of his future in Chicago. And you're talking about a three time Stanley cup winning uh, captain of the organization. You're talking about someone who's going to have a statue outside the United center at some point in the future. And, you know, so I think this is a really cool thing for the, the organization to do. And I imagine the fans will respond in kind you know, once they, they see Jonathan Taves in that sweater for the last time, you know, in, in a building that at its peak, I can tell you having covered all three of those Stanley Cups, it, it rocked as much as any building you could find anywhere um, when, when Chicago was a toast of the town as an NHL organization. You know, as for what's next, it's it's interesting. I mean, I, I read, here's how I read that statement or, or, or what Kyle Davidson told the reporters locally. I mean, it's not his news to say what happens next with Jonathan Taves' career. His news is we've decided we're moving on without our captain, you know, we're going to let him go on to free agency. And, and it's, it's his decision where his career lies next. You know, it's not for, you know, the manager of, of the, the Blackhawks in saying goodbye to him to say that we think he's done. Uh, and so I, I think that I wouldn't read necessarily so much into that statement, but, but certainly from what I know of the situation, I believe that Jonathan Taves, all things being equal, would like to explore his future and would like to see what's out there for him as a free agent. The only question is, is his health going to let him? You know, he, he's been pretty open about some of the struggles he's had with long COVID, um, you know, gave a, a pretty good interview a month or so ago with the local reporters there in Chicago, just talking about the frustration of not feeling like himself having, you know, he, he had difficulty explaining exactly what it feels like, but clearly he's, he doesn't have the, the normal energy that he, that he would. And, and it's, I think it's been a really difficult mental uh, situation as a result of his physical ailment for, for Jonathan Taves. I mean, he, he did miss a season entirely not so long ago because of this. So. You know, I, I think once the dust settles, you know, get through Thursday, get through the end of season meetings, um, let a couple of weeks and months pass. I mean, he's not a free agent officially till July 1st. You know, he'll get a, a better feeling, I think, for where his health at and where his mind's at it if he's ready to ch- tackle a new challenge. But, you know, I, I wouldn't put it against him. I, I, I kind of think that we're going to see him continue next year in the NHL. I mean, he's only 34 years old and he's a different it's a different type of player for the team that, that may sign him than what he's been, right? He, he's, he had the end of this, this contract, this legacy contract, he's making 10 and a half million on the cap. You know, it's, it's a hard contract for other teams to absorb, but you know, if he's coming in on something like a league minimum deal or, or maybe a bonus laden contract with games played bonuses or, or something like that, you know, I think that he's an interesting, um, you know, interesting player for a lot of teams and, and, you know, this is, this is John and Taze's life. I mean, no one was more competitive, right? No one from this generation of players, you know, he was kind of known as captain serious when he was younger, but he was very focused young guy made a huge impact all the way back on the 2010 Canadian Olympic team as the youngest forward on the team. Um, you know, I, I feel like he's going to at least give it one more shot, but I mean, that is said with a huge asterisk. It, it really depends on what he feels and what kind of medical news he gets. I think as, as the next months play out. 
Yeah, I just hope for his sake, the decision that he eventually ends up making, it is in his best interest, considering the fact that he had to deal with long COVID and how much that took away from from the games that he was able to, he could have played uh, in Chicago to end uh, his time here. Well, there, I should say. Um, yeah, as long as he makes the best decision for himself. I am curious, though, if he does feel he is ready to come back for another season. I mean, we're putting the cart before the horse in terms of trying to figure out like which teams would, would, would take him. So we don't need to necessarily go there. But I am intrigued at who would at taking a chance on Jonathan Tays, who is not going to be the same player that he was during those Stanley Cup final runs. Uh, 30 points in 52 games, which, you know, look, the fact that he's still playing, all hats off to him. But uh, I am genuinely curious what that market would look like, especially in a world where the salary cap uh, is not too forgiving for some of these teams, even if he has some of those playoff intangibles that so many GMs like. Well, it's safe to say if he's going to do this, he's signing with a team he thinks has a chance to win. And 100%. you know, on, on, on any given summer, that might be 10 teams as you enter a summer that, that you, if you write down a list of places, you could see things breaking a certain way. And, you know, I, it's probably too soon to say where that would be. You know, everyone automatically goes to sentimental choices. You know, he's a Winnipeg boy, for example. I mean, I, I think there's enough questions about the Jets. Uh, I, I certainly can't rule that out, but I mean, I, I don't know if that w- would it would play out that way. But but you know, the other interesting thing about this for me, Julian, is that he's seen Patrick Kane go on to the Rangers right at the deadline, and and you know, this could this could be different if he hadn't seen that. But I don't know if you saw recently, Jonathan Taves said he he looks good in blue. Actually, uh, you know, he's seen his his That's buddy and, and longtime running mate kind of go and fit in somewhere else. And we'll see how that all plays out for, for Kane in terms of trying to chase the Stanley cup with New York. But I mean, I, I think that this is an emotional thing for a player. Obviously you're, you're with one organization for so long, you're associated with all that past success, but it can also be liberating too. And I wonder if it might be somewhat made easier. I know it's kind of strange to say that he's seen Kane move on. Obviously those two players saw Duncan Keith move on Brent Seabrook move on. Uh, you know, a lot of the players or all the players essentially that they won Stanley Cups with during their time in Chicago uh, at one point or another had either gone into retirement or gone and played elsewhere. And so, you know, I, I think it kind of it, it should be sort of freeing in a way that he can just go and be, you know, say a third line center somewhere, someone who isn't commanding a lot of the cap space, uh, someone who's there to to bring his experience and to to help elevate a team that's already you know, knocking at the door and, and maybe to experience life in a different way, live in a different part of the country and, and all those types of things. And so, you know, I'm with you. I mean, ultimately there's, there's the, there's a, a universe here where his health just says, look, he can't play. And, and, you know, frankly, that's how a lot of players careers end. I mean, not obviously with a specific type of ailment that he has, but, but often, you know, health, the situations make the decision, the final decision for a player to end his playing career. But, you know, I just have to believe that if if there's a way he can play, that this this could be a a positive sort of next, you know, mini chapter in what's what's already been a Hall of Fame career for Jonathan Taves. Yeah, I also I don't know how if you feel this way with seeing players retire who you probably have seen like like we're at the point now where there are players I have seen at the World Juniors, you know, as a kid they're retiring and they're coming out of the league. Like I feel a little bit old. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I'm, I'm older. So I, I definitely, I'm almost, I've had to get over that because, you know, when I first came up around the Leafs, for example, Ty Domi was on the team. And so I covered Ty and now his son, Max Domi's probably an NHL veteran. We, we'd probably call him at this point. So, oh, yes, we would, you know, I, I've covered two generations of a Domi family and, and you can go down the list. It's not just Ty Domi and Max Domi, uh, just the first one example that came to mind. And then eventually we're going to be covering these guys in management, right? I mean, that's, that's how it goes. I mean, that the beauty of our career is it can, you know, you, you hope to last long enough to, to cover multiple generations. Something good's gone on if that's if that's happened. And obviously the, the, it's, it's a different calculus for a player. I mean, players generally get 10 years. I mean, we're talking about Jonathan Taves uncertain about his future. He's 34 years old, Julian. He's a young man by any other measure, but uh, a lot of mileage on his body. Before we bring in DB, has Jonathan Taves ever expressed any interest in working in management in, in hockey? Not that I'm aware of, or and certainly not to me, but you know, he's an interesting guy. The little bit I've gotten to know Jonathan sort of off the ice, he's got a lot of different interests. And, you know, some of them he's talked openly about, you know, he, he's really particular about what he eats and grows a lot of his own food. You know, that's been a passion of his. He's supported various charities along that those things. You know, he's he's been into kind of a lot of what I might call sort of mindfulness practices and and he's an, an avid reader. Um so 
you know, he's a sort of player that I could see quite honestly doing a lot of different things, but you know, he's also kind of a Steve Eisenman disciple in a sense, you know, wearing number 19 and, and he kind of reminds me a little bit of what I know of Steve Eisenman. And, and, you know, Steve is probably the best example of a player who, who went from being a hall of fame player to being basically a hall of fame executive or one of the top GMs in the game. And, and I could see that path there for Jonathan if he wants it. I, I, but I don't really know what's in his heart about that, but, but certainly very, very smart. And, you know, he would never do anything half-assed like anything. So, so I could see whatever he throws his, his kind of attention at and an intention at next, he'll probably be great at it. And and if that's in, in hockey operations, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Uh, on the other side of a sports interaction, we'll talk about the Pittsburgh Penguins and their playoff streak coming to an end. Uh, we will also address all of the e-bugs popping up. The latest epidemic to strike the National Hockey League. E-bugs everywhere! But first, let's get to David Bastel, and you can bet that. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Welcome to You Can Bet That with David Bastel. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash STPN for all of your gaming needs. DB, we only have one, count them, one confirmed playoff series at this moment in time uh, for the upcoming Stanley Cup playoffs, the Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Tampa Bay Lightning. What do we have in terms of bets we can place now uh, when it comes to this series? Yeah, Julian, it's funny because we're only a couple hours away from the end of the season and we're still not exactly sure where everybody's going to fall. But we've known about this one, CJ, for a while. So we have series prices, of course, at Sports Interaction. We have a lot of head-to-head props, so player versus player for most goals. Like there's there's a real popular one, uh, Point versus Matthews, most goals and so forth. And you go down the list of you know top stars from either side head to head in different categories so right now i'll give you this so series winner right now toronto is the favorite sports interaction a 164 just to win the series pretty good value on tampa bay a 238 to win the series and and i should throw this down before i throw it back to you the betting public right now the lowest odds so that usually tells us that's where the money is kind of trickling to although it's all over the place leafs to win the series four games to three is paying about a five. Any thoughts on those initial statements? Well, it's such an interesting series because we all know what the Lightning have done over the last number of years, but we also know what they've done over the last number of months. And since January, they're actually a sub-500 team um, in terms of the points percentage earned. And so I think everyone has to weigh that. I mean, you, you want to have respect for the you know all that they've accomplished, probably the best team of this generation in the NHL, but you... I think that there's enough there to go, wait a minute, is, is are they at the end of their time? Or maybe are they just tired and too beat up at, at this stage of the season? And I think that that's, you know, probably Toronto is worthy as a favorite despite the history here just because of what the regular season has shown us. But, man, those playoff ghosts seem to show up in Toronto once the puck drops uh, come mid-April. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of wild how that is. But, yeah, I mean, Tampa Bay, the fact that they've gone through three consecutive Stanley Cup final runs, that is a ton of hockey to play through. And it's inevitable that you're going to feel fatigue. But, of course, you have to uh, – you can't uh, put down the heart of a champion, right? That's uh, that's a, that's around uh, what the Tampa Bay Lightning seem to believe in. Let's get to another one uh, with regards to top goal scorer for this series. Uh, Austin Matthews, according to Sports Interaction, is the betting favorite to be the top goal scorer of that series. Braden Point is also up there, too. William Nylander as well. What else you got, DB? Yeah, that's uh, another popular one. So it's whatever the series is, if it's four, if it's seven, if it's six games, who will be the top goal scorer in the series? Um, you nailed it there, Matthews. No no doubt a favorite just because of what we've seen in the history department. But I'm going to present this to you, CJ, just because you score in spurts. Sometimes in a series like this, it only takes four or five goals to actually win that type of uh, prop. Ryan O'Reilly... 32 to one. So for every dollar, you get 32 bucks back. $5 bets. Pretty good bet. Um, could he be the top goal scorer in this series? Considering that we've seen spurts of Ryan O'Reilly. We saw, we saw his first couple of games, four goals. And before he goes down with that wrist injury, he's back. He seems to be a little bit of a force as he always is. I guess it depends on where he plays as well, but I kind of like taking flyers like that. I don't like going for the chalky stuff, even though the chalky is probably a good bet too. 
Well, it is, but you know, I'm I'm inclined to, to think like you in terms of you know I don't know who it's going to be in this series, but I, I would look at some of the secondary options because the top guys cancel each other out so much, right? In, in yep. these series, I think that's very common. I remember the Leaf series against Montreal. I think Jason Spezza had three goals in that series, was playing on their fourth line at the time. I mean, that that's the sort of thing that I think consistently uh, you see in the playoffs. I mean, obviously the big dogs. Connor McDavid did pretty well in last year's Edmonton series. So, I mean, th- there are exceptions, but in general, it's, it's a, a team that, that gets through and plays a bunch of rounds. And so, you know, I'm sure there's given the number of talented players on both sides of this one, it may not be just the, the 50 and 60 goal scorers uh, that are getting the job done over these four to seven games. So uh, if you are uh, listening to CJ's advice here, bet on Brandon Hagel and Callie Yarncroft to lead the series <laughs> in goal scoring. Uh, Brandon Hagel at 25.38 and Callie Yarncroft at 46.19. Just in case you want to take that seriously. Callie Yarncroft, first career yep. 20 goal season. That's true. Don't forget yep. to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. We'll talk to you soon, DB. Thanks, guys. This episode of The Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped is here with a deal that you can't pass over this Easter season. See what we did there? They've got the tools to give you the beautifully decorated eggs of your dreams. Just because it's Easter doesn't mean it's okay to hide those bad boys behind all that tall grass. So make sure your downstairs lawn is mowed. Get yourself feeling as sweet as candy by going to manscaped.com and getting 20% off plus free shipping with the code CJ show. It's time to put all your eggs in the perfect basket with the performance package 4.0 by manscaped. They've got the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the weed whacker for your ears, the 2.0 version, uh, the crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop reviver, toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold all of your goodies, all the great stuff that you need to take care of yourself. Also, April is Easter, but it is also Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. Manscaped has partnered with the Testicular Cancer Society to bring awareness to, t- to testicular cancer, men's health, and early cancer detection. Manscaped is, con- is committed uh, to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men between the ages of 15 and 35 and giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their We Save Balls initiative. So we have to mention that a good initiative on their part. Save 20% off and free shipping with the code CJShow at manscaped.com. So it seems like there's always something new and exciting going on at the SDPN. Have you seen our brand new website? SDPN.ca has got a new look and tons of great new content. We've got the SDP, CJ Show, that's us, uh, Noxie and Cax, the Objective Basketball Podcast, Nailing the Apex, Adrian Provocateur, Game Over, the list goes on and on. And you can catch up on all of our latest shows at the brand new sdpn.ca. Plus, we've got news and special features from across the world of sports. It's an awesome website. Add it to your bookmarks. Call your friends. Tell your family, including your grandma. She would really appreciate it. One more time for the people in the back, sdpn.ca. See, speaking of feeling old... We are about to embark on a postseason that uh, will not feature the Pittsburgh Penguins for the first time uh, in 16 years, or at least the 16-year streak they had is over. But also, no Sidney Crosby, no Alexander Ovechkin in the playoffs. That's how you know times are changing. I can't believe this myself. Well, how about this for a bit of trivia? You know, the teams now with the longest active playoff streets are Toronto and Boston at seven years. So that's, oh. a, that's a testament to, you know, how, well, first of all, how difficult it is to string together 16 years as Pittsburgh did. is It's insane. And let me put out a quick note here. This is directly aimed at you, producer Drew, because I see you out there. You love being a troll. And he's trying to say the play-in year didn't count. You know, Pittsburgh's streak ended because they lost the play-in in 2020 to Montreal, and the Leafs lost theirs to Columbus. It does count. It counts in official NHL records. Every player's stats from the play-in counts in their playoffs uh, category. It counts in official league history. And quite honestly, having been in the building, an empty building for most of those games, it wasn't a real playoffs anyway. And that's not taking away from any team that had success or failure, but I'm just saying you made the playoffs. I mean, it was the season was stopped because of a pandemic on March 11th. 
And Pittsburgh, I believe, was fifth overall in the league. The Leafs were were comfortably in a playoff spot. They made the playoffs. So that that's just uh, getting my a little weight off my chest. When I see producer Drew and every tweet I'm putting out there, just trying to rile people up, and he riled me up in the process. I feel like producer Drew has completely embraced being the heel, be, being a heel on Hockey Twitter, because I feel there are more than one heels of the existing Hockey Twitter. But he has fully embraced that at any possible moment, especially with like Oilers fans, for whatever reason. He just pokes the bear with them. He'll poke Oilers the bear fans, fans. Leafs fans, Flames fans. I mean, he's he's in a comfortable spot because he's, you know, a noted Avalanche fan and his team's won the cup. So like he feels like he he's he's occupying some sort of moral hockey Twitter high ground, but he loves to he loves to to poke the beasts. Yeah. All right. Well it's good when it bites back at you, I hope you're able to bite back. That's that's all I have to say to you, producer Drewski. Um, but uh, yeah, with the Penguins and the fact that they are set to miss the playoffs for the first time in a very long time, uh, a lot of complaints, a lot of groans. They lose to Chicago earlier this week. Such a frustrating loss. And then they are eliminated by virtue of the New York Islanders uh, being the Montreal Canadiens yesterday. What is next for this team? They've already committed to to that big three of of Crosby, Latang, and 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 Malkin uh, for the next little while at least. But Ron Hextall, what's his future? What about the rest of the roster? What do you do with this team? Well, there's so many layers to this onion, right? That's what you're getting at here. I mean, it's what's what's fascinating about this specific Penguin season is you had both Crosby and Malkin healthy all year long, and they were both were productive. You know, I think that there were some questions about Evgeny Malkin. Remember, he missed most of last season or half of last season after knee surgery. You know, they, they committed a pretty big contract to him in the offseason after flirting with maybe letting him go to free agency. And so, you know, they're just given his age and the fact he was coming off an injury, there was questions about that. But, he, you know, he wasn't the problem. Sidney Crosby was not the problem. Those guys are getting older, but they're still productive players. And yet here they are. They reached the final week of the season. They have to beat two of the worst teams in the league in Chicago and Columbus, had they just done that, they, they extend that playoff streak to 17 years and, and they're not able to get the job done. And, you know, I think that it is going to prompt a, a bigger look at the organization. I will say this. I think that it was very likely there was going to be a management change, whether they made the playoffs or not. Like I, I don't get, based on what I've heard, there have been high level meetings at the ownership level about the sort of the future and direction of the front office, you know, going back a fair amount of time. So this isn't just like they got to this week, had a bad loss, and then, you know, they're bringing out dynamite and getting ready to, to light the fuse. I, I think that, you know, Fenway Sports Group, which which bought the Penguins in November 2021, you know, inherited a front office with Ron Hextall as general manager, with Brian Burke uh, as the president on the, on the hockey side of things. And, you know, they've been watching and learning and, you know, it's, it's the same for anyone, anywhere. When you're, when you're an inherited front office or, or coach, when a new manager comes in, I mean, it's a, there's a bit of a trial there. Uh, and so, you know, I do think it's very likely that you're going to see a change in this front office going forward. And, and I think what's interesting about that, if it happens is that look at what Fenway sports group does, right? This is a team that, that, you know, an ownership group that, that runs Liverpool in, in the Premier League that, that, you know, owns the Boston Red Sox. I mean, John Henry, when he ran the, when he's Red Sox owner, hired Theo Epstein to, to be the GM. And obviously that brought a lot of success to, to that baseball team. And I, I get the feeling and certainly what my sources have told me is that if, if they make a change here, I think you'll see a different approach. I think you'll see them go for maybe what we might term an outside the box candidate, or, you know, maybe not the traditional hockey man type of um, person for, you know, in terms of or people uh, at the top ends of the hockey department. And so, you know, I think that that's really the first, that's the first shoe that has to drop before we can get into, you know, what do you do with this player or that player? Do you make this trade? I think that they have to figure out who's running the organization, how that's going to work. And then, you know, you let, you turn it over to those people to, to kind of see through with a vision, but, you know, it's kind of an intriguing team because I see it much like the Capitals, Julian, in that the Capitals have vowed to Alex Ovechkin. They're, they're not going to have a full teardown rebuild while he's there. They're going to try to be competitive. So they're trying to retool on the fly this summer. I think the same is very much going to be true in Pittsburgh. We just have to figure out or find out, you know, who's going to be making those decisions uh, before kind of handicapping what it looks like. I know you're not saying this is going to happen, 
But how cool would it be if if Pittsburgh decided to hire a guy like Theo Epstein to run everything in that front office? I believe he's currently working in Major League Baseball as just a consultant. But like this is a guy who obviously knows a thing or two uh, about winning uh, when it comes to Major League Baseball. And it wouldn't be the first time uh, we would see a hire of uh, someone. Uh, well, I don't know why Ralph Kruger comes to mind. Well, we know he is doing his thing in Buffalo, then went off to Southampton, uh, an English <laughs> football club, and then uh, tried to come back with the Oilers. Or am I getting, is he Oilers first or Sabres? Oilers after? first, then Southampton, Oilers first, then, then Southampton. There we go. But yeah, like that was really weird to see. But like, I'm just picturing my mind, like Theo Epstein, uh, with his work in Boston, his work in Chicago as well. Like he knows a thing or two. That would just be a fun thing to have happen. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought at all about that possibility. I have no idea, no concept. I'm certainly not connecting the two. I was really more saying, look at the history of of the ownership group in terms of the types of things they might do. Um, but you know, you're right. We've seen other sports. I mean, you know, in baseball, the Houston Astros hired people from NASA and entrusted them with building models to help them with player. Uh, selection and and identifying talents and all those types of things. I mean, I, you know, and we've seen clearly there's we're already on the other end of the analytics, what I call revolution in hockey. Basically, every organization worth its salt is using analytics to varying from at least a little bit to a massive high degree that that informs almost every important decision and, and small decision they make when it comes to to players and personnel. Um, you know, so I, I think that there's lots of different options, you know, people that you and I have never heard of that could be on the radar for those types of positions. If, if someone wanted to be that bold, I mean, we haven't seen it a lot in hockey and, and, you know, maybe it, maybe the way it plays out is if they make a full scale change in Pittsburgh, maybe you're installing someone as a president who has experience in a front office and then sort of entrusting the GM's role to someone who's maybe doesn't have the, the institutional hockey experience, but can bring a lot that way. I mean, I think that this will all have to be kind of sussed out, but, but certainly it seems as though the, there's an appetite for change in Pittsburgh. And, and, you know, I don't think it would surprise anyone at this point if that change was, you know, some significant moves in, in the front office. Of course, uh, there will be people in Pittsburgh speculating about names who are already in hockey. Uh, oh, you don't on, say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, one tweet going around uh, from uh, Mark Madden, uh, who does radio in Pittsburgh, uh, put out a really interesting tweet. Uh, Dubis to Penguins whispers are getting louder. Like, what does that mean? You know, like, I understand Kyle Dubis has uh, some contract talks to go through when it comes time. But like whispers, like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. I'm not I'm not trying to dump on Mark. Like, I'm just I want to understand that tweet. I want to understand where that's coming from. Well, I would think that he's saying he's suggesting he's hearing that talk more and more. And usually, I mean, I've, I've probably use whispers. You know, when I say whispers, usually you just mean like from people close to the situation or people that would have some knowledge of it. You know, what I'll say is I don't have any specific knowledge of that myself um, in terms of connecting Kyle Dubas to the Pittsburgh Penguins. I'd still be surprised. If, if we're talking about him leaving the Leafs at all, no matter what happens in the playoffs. I mean, it's actually good that we're recording this before the playoffs uh, because my point is I wouldn't be reacting too emotionally when it came to a GM decision, no matter how four or four to seven games go against the Tampa Bay Lightning or whatever happens beyond that, if they do advance. And, you know, but at the same time, you know, perhaps Mark being based in Pittsburgh is hearing from people near the ownership group in terms of their wish list and, and, to me, it would make a whole lot of sense if you're compiling a wish list of people you might want that you would take a general manager who isn't yet 40, uh, who's had a tremendous amount of success his entire five years in the big chair with the Leafs, has managed a salary cap through a pandemic where it didn't go up at all and still kept his team, you know, they're at 109 points as we're recording this this season. They had 115 last year, you know, has, has kept his team consistently among the absolute top in the league, has you know, I speak to a lot of people from other teams that, that talk with a lot of respect for the way Kyle does his business, the way he's built out the Leafs organization. Obviously, he has access to resources that, that only a handful of teams would in terms of the money he can spend on on the things that aren't connected to the roster, whether that's sports science or uh, the, their, their health program, their analytics, all those types of things. I mean, they employ a lot of people, but he's built out that organization. It's It's probably the class of the NHL. Um, behind the scenes, you know, things you don't see on the ice. And so, 
yeah, <laughs> if, if you can have an ability to bring someone like that in, I think you would. I, I, I still have a hard time believing the Leafs are going to be in a position where they, they aren't resigning him. I have no reason to believe I should say too, that he wants to move on at this point in time, because you know, there is, there's two sides of this, right? I mean, you, your contract's expiring. We're wondering, does he get extended a contract? Well, we should also wonder, does he want to stay? But you know, I, I think that all the work that Kyle's put in the program, how caring he is, the relationships he has, I, I can't imagine he would really, if, if the opportunity was there to stay, I can't imagine he'd be the one walking away. I just think, you know, he's so invested in, in the team and the organization and in getting it right. And, and look, we don't even know, maybe they're going to get it right here in the next few weeks and months. Uh, but even if they don't, I, I, I think he would want to stay around and I can't imagine a scenario where they're letting him walk out the door, but you know, let's, let's get our popcorn out and see what else comes out of Pittsburgh. Cause it, I, you know, it seems like that, that sentiment is growing there that the, the penguins would like him. I just, I don't think they're going to get to a point where they have an ability to talk to him and hire him. Today isn't the day for us to have a lengthy conversation about Dubis and the Leafs and, and the future. I acknowledge that because, you know, we, there's a playoff series for them to play through. But that day when it happens, uh, if it has to happen at all, that is going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, for me, with just hearing you say that, like, you know, hey, uh, you don't see a situation where where he could be leaving regardless. Or you're trying to say it around that way. I hope I'm not, like, twisting your words. Sorry. But, like, there's one scenario where I see that kind of all falling down. But, again, today is not the day to have that conversation. Today is not that day. You just got to just gotta close the box. Let's close the box. <laughs> wow. I mean, don't... If you were him, why would you leave, right? I mean, I guess, look, they're going to have to meet his contract demands, whatever those are. You know, he's going to get a raise, I would assume. He's, you know, based on his track record and what he's proven. But, you know, he's built this thing from ground up. And I, I believe that he believes in the team and he believes in those players. Like, he's said it consistently. Like, if you go back to, like, the second and third year in the league for guys like uh, Nylander and Marner, like, there was all kinds of commentary on this team. Like they're going to have to trade these guys. They're not going to be able to afford them all this and this and that. And remember Kyle went on, I think it was 32 thoughts podcast and said, you know, we can, and we will resign them. He did that. He's continued to put a strong team around those players. I realize there's, there's a whole debate about whether he should have or not. That, that actually isn't the point of what I'm saying here is the point is he has believed in these guys. I can't believe he would want to walk, walk away without seeing the job through. So, you know, I, I, Look, I'm I'm already on record on this. I think it's crazy they even came into this season with his contract status not sort of squared away just because I don't see I, I don't see where this benefits the Leafs in any way, shape, or form, other than maybe it's a bit of a public relations thing that they thought it was like the wrong message to send or something to give him an extension. But um I think he's one of the best at what he does in the league already. And I guarantee you if he ever is leaving Toronto that he will have ample opportunity to work elsewhere. And I certainly think we're going to see him win a Stanley cup at some point during his career. Let me throw out another name before we get to uh, our final topic with e-bugs. If Brian Burke is still around in Pittsburgh, I mean, maybe, maybe he will, maybe he won't. What about Brad Trilliving? I wonder if Brad Trilliving would be interested in, in a position in Pittsburgh, if it doesn't work out with him in Calgary and they decide to move on from Ron Hextall. But also with Brian Burke, we have to consider maybe he's not necessarily safe there too. That's That well, might be just a bit of a speculation, but I don't know. I I don't see a scenario where Brian Burke would still be there if Ron Hextall was fired. You know, they, they came in as a tandem. In fact, Brian Burke initially was just helping out the, the former ownership group of the Penguins in terms of identifying candidates for the GM job when they offered him the president's job. He wasn't even meaning to apply for a job there, but I, I think that they're tied at the hip. So I, I think they go together. Okay. Um, and, you know, as I say, it's not that it's no knock on Brad tree living, but I, I think if the penguins ownership goes in this direction, I don't think they're looking for someone with Brad's experience. I think they're more, I think they're trying to, to find the next great GM versus, you know, someone who's, who's worked elsewhere and had, had success. All right. So now we move on to the epidemic e-bugs conversations about signing e-bugs off the street emergency backup goaltender for those who don't know what the acronym stands for of uh, the Leafs have had three in a week a couple four. moments ago before we started recording four, four I'm sorry Thursday. Samuel Richard or Samuel Richard I don't know if it's Richard, a French name yeah. or... okay so it's a French name uh Samuel Richard is the latest uh to join the Toronto Maple Leafs as an emergency backup 
goaltender. How do you feel about e-bugs? Have we had that discussion? I feel like we might have. I forget how you feel about e-bugs. I, I don't have a hot take. You know, I can't get sanctimonious on this. It's funny. Like, I, I obviously am talking to a lot of people, texting people throughout the days. Like, some people in hockey are really fired up about this. Not just the Leafs. I mean, look, Washington is playing a game on Thursday night, uh, having a, a backup e-bug as well, um, you know, with Charlie Lindgren out injured. And, and you know, some of this is unavoidable. If you get injuries late in the season, uh, you, you can't put players on long-term injured reserve and get the cap benefit of that. And so you have teams like the Leafs and the Capitals, they run into injuries late in the year and th- there's no, there's no way for them to call up extra players. I mean, what, what can you really do other than the, the path they've chosen? You know, I, I think that the Leafs situation would have been, you know, they played Florida on Monday night in, in a game that had huge consequences at the time in the Eastern conference wildcard race, you know, had an e-bug got into that game uh, for the Leafs. I think that that would have been a different conversation. I mean, what we're really talking about now, I mean, obviously the Leafs put Jed Alexander in on Saturday night for 70 seconds. We did go over that on Monday's show. But, you know, for the most part, these guys are just getting the experience of a lifetime. Um, you know, getting a day or a night with an NHL team, sitting on the bench, wearing a sweater, probably nervously watching to make sure the starter doesn't go down injured because then all of a sudden they, they might have their David Ayers moment. Um, but, you know... I think that it would be nice if there was a way for the league to institute a better rule to say, have teams be able to have a third goaltender, but they've, they've tried that with the players association. And, you know, my understanding of the talks at that time was that the NHLPA doesn't want kind of players outside the system that could maybe be used to block the path to the NHL for, for legitimate prospects. And obviously the league is very mindful of not having any money that isn't accounted for under the hard cap. And so this is the only other solution is these what are called amateur goalies. Keep in mind, they can't bring a goalie even out of the ECHL to do this. It has to be players that have just either finished their junior career, which is where the Leafs have got a lot of their guys, or maybe playing Canadian University hockey, which is where Richard is with the University of New Brunswick. Um, And so (laughs) the system is what it is. I I do wonder, and it's too soon to say, if the league will look at changing some of the rules here because maybe they don't like having it happen this much. But I I think you're going to see more of it. Um, because so many teams get tight to the cap. And if there's not an escape valve, once you run into injuries, I mean, we've seen what the Calgary flames of years ago played with 15 skaters in a game, uh, Vegas, a couple seasons ago, routinely played with 16 or 17 skaters because of cap issues. This is kind of an extension of that. Uh, but they let you have a backup, um, from, from junior or what have you to, to be there. So I, I, I don't put it this way. The, the epidemic doesn't bother me. I'm kind of a sucker for a good story, but I can see why people say like, this is a, whatever, this is a real professional sports league. You can't be pulling people off the street and putting them in goalie gear and, you know, have them be that, you know, one, one puck or one injury away from having to get into an actual game. So wouldn't the simple fix to this, just, just tweak the rule that says you're allowed to bring in like an ECHL goal, ECHL goalie. Like why, why does it have to, why why does it have to be a U sports goalie? Why does it have to be someone from junior? Like why can't they just have it from another professional league, albeit from a much lower tier than the AHL? Like why can't they just have it that way? Well, what they could have, they could just have the emergency recall not kick in when you miss a game down, you know. Right now the rule is you can call a player up and he doesn't count against your cap once you've played short for one game. But you could have it with goalies where it doesn't have to be that way. Basically, you get a free recall of a guy who doesn't count against the cap and can come up in a moment's notice. And then you can bring your AHL goalie up. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure Washington has a player that's playing in Hershey that could come up and be backing up this game. And obviously the Leafs, you know, had Joseph wall, they could call up Eric Schalgren. I mean, these guys have played NHL games before and, and are obviously professional level goaltenders. You know, I, I think the league really doesn't want any ability to kind of get around the cap, right? I mean, first they establish a hard cap and then all the rules are about designed to keep it as, as locked in and as tight as possible. And that's how we get here. The tighter the, the restrictions are, the more, the, the, you know, when you, when you close everything in, you're going to need pressure release at some point. And, th- and this is the pressure release valve is like, we have no room to call a guy up. We have no one that we can do. So this is, this is the next option. So, you know, I, I guess it's probably going to take one of these players getting into a game where it's total egg on the NHL's face to maybe change the rule. Like we haven't seen that happen. And even, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in tonight's games, but the Leafs Rangers game doesn't have consequences in the standage that the, the devils are, are in Washington. Like, like that's not going to change anything. So 
even if these players end up somehow getting in on Thursday night, it doesn't really change the conversation. But if, if, if any of them had to play in a, a game with big playoff consequences, I mean, you'd have the whole league screaming bloody murder. <laughs> That's true. Also, one idea that just popped into my head, it's not a serious idea. Uh, I think David Alter suggested this once upon a time too. Uh, just let let your backup goaltender be a position player. I know that would never go, but could you imagine like Mark Giordano putting on the pads just in case you need an extra backup goaltender? Yeah, I mean, I guess what I can't imagine Mark Giordano doing that, but why not? <laughs> I I know there was a game in the Erie, uh, maybe ten years ago, where the, a position player actually played net for the Erie Otters in the OHL. So it, it has happened. I mean, obviously different rules in the OHL that wasn't cap related. It's just, they didn't have a goalie. Um, so, you know, David Alter likes outside the box ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to him on that one. Yeah. He's uh, also, anything a else you want... so if he's the also Leafs what? Need, he's also was a goaltender in his day, David Alter. So if the uh... Leafs needed a backup to the backup to the backup, they should call David down from the press box. I don't know how I feel about media getting involved, uh, but uh, I would still pay to see that. That would be funny. Uh, I can't remember the what was the old school reporter's name that was always he he like went and tried out for an NFL team and he played net for the Boston Bruins. There's a famous old sports reporter that did that. So, that, you oh know, god, what's what what goes around comes around. Who knows? Maybe we'll see that again in the future. I don't. I don't. I don't know that story. I've yeah, never heard that story. It's it's way it's way before my time even. Um, but I should know the gentleman's name. I just forget it right now. I know, I know. It's not a like a nothing to do with reporters or nothing to do with like athletes. But there's a famous story of like Marvin Gaye having friends on the Detroit Lions and was very close to getting a tryout on the team, but like that kind of got stopped. But uh, you know, it's not not impossible to see uh, you know people come out of left field. Uh, George, to, to step in George Plimpton George Pl George Plimpton sounds like the basis for like a really cool like like funkadelic esque band George Flimpton Plimpton with a P and he was uh, he was very he was much he did, he did what's called sort of participatory journalism like he he was in the stories himself and in 1977 uh, he went to Boston Bruins training camp that's insane yeah. Yeah, I and, never knew anything about this guy. And he wrote wrote a book called Open Net, documenting the experience. Okay. All right. So uh for the uh, inaugural edition of CJ's Book Club, uh read Open Net. <laughs> well, I think actually his more famous book is called Paper Lion, and he went yeah. to Detroit Lions training camp. So as, Okay, the Detroit Lions. But imagine nineteen seventy seven. I think Bobby Orr still would have been a Bruin. Like he's at training camp with Bobby Orr. That's pretty sick. It would, would you ever, I mean, probably not, no. but like, no. <laughs> no, don't even, no. Uh, <laughs> It'd be funny though. Uh, yeah. I mean, I embarrass myself enough as it is that, that no one needs to see that. You know, Three goals, I, 21 seconds. Yeah. That was a long time ago, man. That was in like, <laughs> 19, that was in like 1992 or something. <laughs> hey, that's not that far off. That's only 30. I mean, 31 years. The newspaper clipping from that accomplishment is in the Coburg Sports Hall of Fame. That's how long ago it is. It's like, it's in, it's in like the history books. It's not in anything that's present. I'll tell you this. So when I played, uh, when I used to cover golf, which I did for a fair bit in the earlier part of my career in golf, you get a lot of opportunities to say, go play the course before the tournament's held or after it's held. And I did play a couple of times, like either once I played a whole round with a PJ tour player and I certainly had a couple other instances where you play like a hole or two here and there. And that's, that is truly humbling. Like, like these guys must be like, why do we like, if you watch us play golf, you're like, we shouldn't care what any of these guys write or say about us. Cause they have, they have no authority on the matter. Oh man. I, I, I did you write about any of those instances? Like just for yourself? No, or? no one was with a guy named David Hearn, who was a longtime Canadian pro played on the PJ tour. And it was just, it, it was just sort of a media day event or something. Uh, a guy who won the Canadian, Canadian Open named Ches Reevy, American guy. I remember we had to play like a hole with him. But yeah, no, it's just, it's more social. It's more part of like the golf culture, I guess. Um, anyway, I got, I'm off topic now, but I have played golf with a PJ Tour player and I was like, this is truly embarrassing. I have no, I, I had no idea. And like this, this last part of the show 
so revelatory. Like so many new things I've learned in the last like few minutes. I'm very grateful for this. That's awesome. Don't wo- stop stop complaining about being off topic when you're dropping gems like this. <laughs> the only the only place I would maybe want to go with a, a player of a sport or like a current athlete is as I think I could handle pickleball with them. Okay. That's, That's a sport. I, well, I'm I'm really enjoying it. I'm not saying I'm that good, but I can definitely hold my own. And it's the kind of sport you can't really embarrass yourself too much if you can if you can do the fundamental things, like you you kind of can just hang and not embarrass yourself. So yeah, I know a lot of the GMs are playing pickleball in the NHL. So that would be one area I would be happy to meet them in a sporting environment. Future story idea, uh the pickleball league that includes uh all thirty two NHL GMs. I mean, honestly, like the GM meetings, they used to all go golfing in the old days. Now, like half the crew goes and plays pickleball, like in the afternoon instead of, uh, instead of just the golf nuts. So. All right. Uh, I believe we have time for stick taps. Uh, do you want to start? Should I start? How do you want to go about it? I'd also run against most of them in a distance race. Not all of them. <laughs> Not all of them. You'd, you'd wax them. You'd wax uh, them. I don't know. There's some pretty fit guys in the group, but. Okay, very I mean, true, fair. They're, they're, yeah, like like Sackick, Iserman, some of those guys who are like, it's still good shit. Rod Francis, fine, no. Some um, of those guys will probably have bad knees from their playing career, so I could probably handle them over 13 miles slash 21K. Yes. yes, I like this. Talk your shit. <laughs> I was, on, on, on Easter weekend, I was down and I, I went out for my run and my, my nephew, Henry, who's like eight years old, started running beside me and he like blazed past me on the street. And I was like, Henry, oh. he's, I'm like, dude, I'll let you win in the hundred meter chase. But like, if you can hang with me for 10 kilometers, then, then let's talk. Look at CJ, man. Uncle CJ out here. Just, you know, no, it was laying, fun. Down, laying down the gauntlet. You should, you need to know our family. If you're you, not, if you're not, you could you're not getting your turfed 50s. in our family. You're not loved. So that's, that's part you could of be it. an HL GM. You could be a little child. You could get it from Chris Johnston. You could play pickleball. That too. Do you have a stick tap? Um, I didn't prepare one. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to give mine to uh, producer Nick, actually. He tweeted out something really interesting and profound of uh, the other day. Um, this is a tweet from his Twitter, uh, Nick Andrade. Uh, Got to remember to post my W. So uh, eight years in sports media, and this is the first year I have season-long creds for the Toronto Blue Jays. Seven-year-old Nick would probably cry being close to the action yesterday. Enjoy your victories, no matter how big, small, and don't forget to enjoy the ride. I just thought it was a really cool tweet. And just, you know, I, I love moments like that where you're able to take a moment and just realize like, hey man, like I'm here, I'm doing well, and you're celebrating a W. So a stick tap to producer Nick for being able to celebrate his W, man. Congratulations. That's a big victory. I, I remember first getting like creds, like you, you're like, this is nuts. Like they just let me into the games. You know, when I was a kid, I just wanted to go all of the games and really couldn't go to too many. So that's that's awesome, Nick, for in your corner i'll give my stick tap to kevin kiermeyer then on oh the, on what a the grab topic of baseball because he's uh electrified us blue jays fans here in the first two weeks that he's been on the team after breaking our hearts so often when he was down in tampa so great to have him up in toronto happy to have baseball back it was cool they had the dome open for game two at home uh on on wednesday and uh i'm pretty pumped that the jays are back so i'll i'll, I'll give a stick tap to uh a baseball player has got me pretty excited for the season. And um, yeah, we'll get back to hockey next week. Once the playoffs start. It was almost 30 degrees in Toronto the other day. Did I hear that right? Today too, man. Yo, wow. Jealous. It was snowing yesterday in here. In I'm actually, I'm going to meet James Myrtle later tonight for a beer. And he's like, we got to get a patio. Oh, and like okay. a week ago, it was like snowy here and like not actually, but like it was cold here a week ago. Now we're like sitting on a patio. This Life comes at you fast, bro. Uh, send my regards to Myrtle. Uh, you know, just just because. Might as well. You know? Is he your boss? Uh, yes. I'll put, in, I'll put in a good word then. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. All kidding aside, uh, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in uh, to today's episode of the CJ Show. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. Get your questions in now for Ask CJ. That's what we do every Monday, taking in questions. Some go into uh, the Inside the NHL newsletter. Uh, Sometimes they cross over into both. It's just fun questions, man. We just love to hear from you guys and uh, what you want to ask Big Money Siege. So get your questions in now. The weirder, 
the better. Uh, and of course, with uh, the playoffs starting on Monday, Monday is going to be very, very fun. I hope you're ready, Siege. I'm ready, bud. I can't wait. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, and happy birthday, Adam Wilde. The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.